Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Georgios Tsivgoulis, a vascular neurologist from Athens, and I want to welcome you all to the WebDronic webinar entitled Cryptogenic Stroke Patient Need Answers, AF Screening Patient Strategies and Patient Certification. This is a webinar that has been endorsed by ESO. We have an international faculty with a large clinical experience and a an important research record on this topic. The first speaker will be myself and I will discuss guidelines for AF detection in cryptogenic stroke, patient risk certification and role of insertable loop recorders. The spe second speaker will be Professor Danilo Toni, who is a vascular neurologist from Siap Sapienza University of Rome. Professor Toni will discuss about patient pathways and monitoring strategies for cryptogenic stroke or progressive monitoring strategies cost effective. The third speaker is a cardiologist from the University of Porto, Professor Cristina Gavina. She is going to discuss about burden and risk profile in determining AF search strategies. Today is also the International Women's Day, and I would like to welcome you all to celebrate all the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. So I will be the first speaker, and I will discuss the current guidelines for AF detection cryptogenic stroke focusing on patient risk certification and role of insertable loop recorders. This is my intellectual and financial disclosure slide. We all know that there are multiple underlying mechanisms in ischemic stroke, including large artery, extracranial or intracranial atherosclerosis, cardioembolism, PFO-associated stroke, small vessel disease, and cryptogenic stroke. Uh, approximately 88% of uh, all strokes are ischemic and 12% are hemorrhagic. Out of ischemic strokes, 23% are lacunar and 77% are non-lacunar. Among patients with non-lacunar stroke, 45% have cryptogenic stroke. And out of cryptogenic stroke patients, 50% of these patients have issues, embolic stroke of undetermined stroke source following a comprehensive workup. And the remaining 50% have non-issues. We know that there are uh, multiple underlying mechanisms in patients with issues with multiple etiologies, including paradoxical embolism via PFO, minor cardiac sources of embolism, for instance, valvular disease, artery to artery embolism in patients with non hemodynamically significant extracranial or intracranial stenosis, cancer associated stroke, and of course, in a minority of patients. There is paroxysmal lateral fibrillation that can be detected using implantable cardiac monitoring. We know that the safety profile of NOAX is not similar to antiplatelet safety profile. We know that the indiscriminate anticoagulation of all issues patients is not supported by RCT data and is not cost effective because it increases the risk of intracranial bleeding. We know that cardioembolism is not the only pathogenic mechanism of cerebral ischemia in issues and that the yield of AF detection in patients with cryptogenic strokes increases substantially with longer monitoring duration. Paroxysmal AF detected with loop recorders is not a temporal phenomenon in patients with cryptogenic stroke, and it's associated with increased clinical risk of AF and increased risk of stroke. There are emerging data that AF detection using implantable loop recorders may result in effective primary and secondary stroke prevention. So what are the current international recommendations for management of uh, stroke patients with cryptogenic stroke? These are the uh, recommendations of the European Society of Cardiology endorsed by ESO in 2016. And there is a class 2A level B recommendation that in stroke patients, additional ECG monitoring using long-term implantable loop, loop recorders should be considered to document silent atrial fibrillation. The 2019 American Heart Association, American Stroke Association guidelines also recommend with a class of recommendation 2A and level of evidence B that in patients with cryptogenic stroke with inconclusive external ambulatory monitoring, implantation of loop recorders is reasonable to optimize detection of silent AF. And these are the nice guidelines that strongly advocate reveal link in patients with cryptogenic stroke or TIA However, they do not recommend other monitors, including Biomonitor 2 AF, Biomonitor 3, or Confirmer X due to a large number of false positive results. 
These are the 2020 European Society of Cardiology guidelines, and they're more specific. They uh, advocate that in selected stroke patients without previously known AF, additional ECG monitoring using long-term non-invasive ECG monitors or insertable cardiac monitors should be considered to detect AF. This is a class 2A level B recommendation, and they highlight that in selected patients, they include patients of older age, patients with cardiovascular risk factors or comorbidities, patients with left atrial remodeling on echocardiography, and patients with high chest score. And chest score has been developed in a French nationwide study. It has five components and ranges between zero and seven. The higher the score, the higher the yield of AF detection. And you can see that with increasing uh, chest score numbers, the yield of AF detection increases linearly. With regard to the risk stratification, there are three groups, low with zero to one, medium with two and three, and high with four or higher points. And you can see that compared to low chest score, patients with high chest score have a five-fold increase in the yield of AF detection. Other important Risk markers for detection of paroxysmal AF in cryptogenic stroke include echocardiographic markers uh, like premature atrial breach on Holter monitoring, echocardiographic mar markers including left atrial dilatation, and neuroimaging markers including multiple embolic strokes with cortical or subcortical distribution. These are the 2021 American Heart Association, American Stroke Association guidelines. And again, they give a level of evidence 2A with a class of recommendation B with uh, regard to detection of AF in cryptogenic stroke using implantable loop recorders. These are the current European Society of Cardiology, uh, European Heart Rate Association, and European Society of Cardiology Digital Health Committee position paper that was authored by multiple experts from different societies, including cardiology, neurology, internal medicine. And I was a co-author in this paper. And we advocate the use of Havoc score with a cut of four or greater, or Brown issues AF score with a cut of two or, or greater, in order to select the cryptogenic stroke patients who should be implanted with loop recorders. We know that Havoc score has been well internally and externally validated. It has uh, seven components. The higher the Havoc score, the higher the yield of AF detection, ranging from zero to 14 points. The Brown issues AF score is simpler. It has only two components and it ranges between zero and four. Uh, these are the pivotal papers that have established Havoc score, and they show that patients with low Havoc, ranging from 0 to 4, have a yield of AF detection of 3%, and this increases to 25% in patients with high Havoc score exceeding uh, 10 points. Havoc score has been compared to Chadvask score, and it shows higher specificity and higher overall accuracy compared to Chadvask score. Now, with regard to Brown issues AF score, it has been developed in the Brown University. It has not been externally validated. It used a cohort. Of, it has been validated internally only in a cohort of patients with issues. And it showed that, that the risk of AF detection increased with a Brown issue score of two or greater. Actually, there are only two components, age and moderate or severe left anterior uh, enlargement, which corresponds to a left atrial volume index of greater than 34 ml per square meter. And in this cohort, the cell statistic of brown issue score for AF detection was high, 0.73. Now, the current European Stroke Organization recommendations have been published a couple of months ago, and I had uh, the privilege to be a reviewer of this recommendation. They used the GRADE methodology. They had predefined PICO questions they conducted systematic review of randomized control trials and available observational studies. They conducted new meta-analysis and they also cited existing meta-analysis and expert consensus statement were issued using the Delphi methodology with a majority vote. So the first uh, strong recommendation is 
for prolonged cardiac monitoring instead of standard 24-hour monitoring to increase the detection of subclinical AF. And the expert consensus statement suggests that prolonged cardiac monitoring should be uh, lasting for more than 48 hours. They also suggest with a weak recommendation, the use of outpatient monitoring in addition to in-hospital cardiac monitoring in order to detect AF in patients with cryptogenic stroke. Then there is another strong recommendation that the implantable devices, implantable root recorders should be used for cardiac monitoring instead of non-implantable devices to increase the detection of subclinical AF. With regard to biochemical echocardiographic or electrocardiographic biomarkers, these guidelines recommend not to use them in order and not to exclude any potential candidates with cryptogenic stroke from implantable cardiac monitoring. This is based on our recent meta-analysis showing that the stronger prediction for AF detection in patients with cryptogenic stroke who were implanted was the duration of monitoring. Actually, the cumulative AF detection rate was 23%. And this meta-analysis shows that among patients with cryptogenic stroke who underwent implantable cardiac monitoring, two were the independent predictors of high yield of AF detection, increasing age and increasing duration of monitoring. Actually, if the duration of monitoring is less than six months, the AF detection rate is only 5%. If the monitoring duration exceeds 24 months, the AF detection rate increases to 34%. Moreover, it is not important the timing between stroke onset and the initiation of monitoring. Another important recommendation is related to patients with PFO. So these guidelines highlight that in patients with PFO who are older than 55 years old, we should be using longer duration of monitoring and implantable cardiac monitors or the more appropriate tool. However, in patients who are younger than 55 years old, 24-hour telemetry or Holter ECG would be enough to rule out subclinical AF. So in brief, this current ISO recommendation highlights the importance of longer duration of cardiac monitoring with ILR in order to increase the detection of subclinical AF in cryptogenic stroke. This is a position paper between neurologists and cardiologists, between the Hellenic Neurological Society and the Hellenic Cardiological Society. Uh, and uh, we suggest the following four indicators for risk stratification of cryptogenic stroke patients for implantable cardiac monitoring. Havoc score four points or greater, atrial premature beats more than 500 on 24-hour Holter monitoring, cortical or cerebellar embolic infarctions, and left atrial dilatation documented either with a left atrial diameter of more than 45 millimeters or a left atrial volume index exceeding 34 ml per square meter. Now, uh, the number of atrial premature beats was based on this post hoc analysis of EMBRACE trial, showing that in patients with more than 500 atrial premature beats on Holter monitoring, the F detection rate was 24%, and this is a high yield of AF detection. There is also strong evidence coming from Italy showing that in patients who are 60 years older or older and have also cortical or cerebellar infarction, the yield of AF detection is 33% in contrast to uh, patients with cryptogenic stroke without evidence of cortical infarction where the yield of AF detection is only 14%. And finally, in this elegant German study, it was shown that left atrial size exceeding 45 millimeters was a strong prediction of AF detection among patients with cryptogenic stroke. And this association persisted both in univariate and multivariate analysis that controlled for potential confounders. This was the strongest and most independent predictor of IAF detection. This finding was also reproduced in a North American study that I also co-authored, where it was shown that left atrial volume index was a strong independent predictor of AF detection in issues. And this slide summarizes the current multidisciplinary consensus paper for AF detection across Europe coming from Austria, Spain, UK, Germany, and Greece. So my final conclusions are that 
Oral anticoagulation should be contraindicated in indiscriminate issues or cryptogenic stroke patients. Prolonged cardiac monitoring using plantable loop recorders should be employed in all cryptogenic stroke patients with adequate and individualized diagnostic workup according to current ISOC guidelines. Havoc score four or greater, chest score four or greater, cortical location of infarction, atrial premature beats of more than 500 on Holter monitoring, left atrial enlargement on echocardiography appear the pro most promising tools for risk stratification. Cryptogenic stroke patients younger than 60 years old without any structure or electrophysiological cardiac pathology show a very low yield for AF detection. Implantable cardiac monitoring of more than two years is the diagnostic tool with the highest yield for AF detection. Thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Professor Tsigoulis, for the presentation. Uh, the talk that has been uh, uh, given to me is just to discuss about uh, the patient pathways and monitoring strategies for cryptogenic stroke and whether uh, the pro progressive monitoring strategies are cost effective. Uh, so these my, are my disclosures, and then these are the two issues that I will discuss with you. Uh, first, which cryptogenic stroke patients should undergo AF search, or should all cryptogenic stroke patients uh, um, undergo AF research? Um, according to uh, the uh, very well-known uh, milestone uh, uh, Crystal AF trial, we know uh, that uh, out of a number of uh, patients with cryptogenic stroke, 400 patients were uh, approximately 400 patients were included in that study. Um, during the subsequent months, six months, 12 months, th and 36 months, uh, using an ILR, an uh, uh, implantable loop uh, recorder, uh, uh, in comparison with the usual follow up, uh, you have the opportunity the, uh, to uh, um, uh, to uh, find uh, IF in up to uh, eight nine percent of cases uh, uh, by six months, in up to uh, twelve percent of cases by uh, twelve months, and in up to thirty percent of cases uh, in three years. Uh, this is the information uh, that we got from the Crystal AF trial and uh, a subsequent elegant and interesting study um, performed by this group uh, give us mm, some additional clues. Uh, what uh, did uh, this, uh, um, uh, these researchers? They took the data uh, of the Crystal AF database and they evaluated uh, which ones uh, are among the patients of the Crystal EF trials uh, would have been uh, included in the Navigate ISUS trial or in the RESPECT ISUS trial. That are the two uh, very large uh, clinical trials in which we compared direct oral anticoagulants to aspirin uh, in, in the patients uh, with uh, ISUS. So, they uh, found out that uh, uh, patients of the Crystal AF database that would have corresponded to the Navigate ISUS criteria for randomization uh, would have had uh, ultra fibrillation in up to 36% uh, of cases, while patients corresponding to the RESPECT ISUS criteria would have had uh, AF in up to 34% of cases. Hence, the question is, if this is the probable rate of AF that could be detected in cryptogenic strokes. Is it cost effective in planting 100 patients to find 35 with AF? According uh, to the uh, European Stroke Organization guidelines that uh, were um, uh, recently published by this group of uh, well estimated colleagues, uh, the reply would be uh, no, or, or better, yes, we, we should. Um, we should implant, we should uh, uh, search AF in all these patients. Why? Because they start from this uh, evidence-based recommendation. So they uh, wrote that there are no data, no enough data in literature, uh, and, and there is uh, a great uncertainty uh, over the advantages to use blood or echocardiographic or e electrocardiographic or heart or brain imaging biomarkers to increase the detection of subclinical AF. And hence, they didn't do any uh, kind of recommendation on this issue. But the uh, uh, accompanying expert consensus statement uh, is that, according to these soldiers, uh, um, uh, 
there is a suggestion to avoid uh, to use any uh, of these possible uh, uh, variables uh, uh, to select patients uh, uh, to be uh, uh, to be implanted with you know, to be you know investigated uh, for uh, the presence of AF which means uh, in uh, uh, automatically that all patients should be uh, um, investigated I personally uh, disagree uh, uh, with this point of view, and I wish I, I will try to, to show you why, because uh, in literature there are uh, some uh, predictive scores uh, more or less uh, well performing uh, in uh, determining, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the risk uh, of having AF and hence in identifying uh, those patients that could be uh, investigated uh, more appropriately and more effectively uh, for the presence of AF. One of these uh, scores is the Chatzba score, uh, which you know that actually uh, was uh, defined, was identified uh, to um, look for um, uh, at the risk of uh, embolic event of stroke or other embolic event in patients with other fibrillation. While in this study, it was used by these colleagues uh, to look for the risk of having atrial fibrillation in the subsequent years after uh, an uh, index ischemic stroke without atrial fibrillation. So you see that approximately 230 patients uh, were studied uh, without any um, prolonged registration. So this is only, a, 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 let's say, an uh, ambulatory or outpatient uh, clinic evaluation with sporadic uh, electrocardiograms in a very long follow-up of nine years. And this Authors found uh, that um, uh, Chazba score performed quite well in defining the different levels of risk of having atrial fibrillation over the years, and they uh, uh, identified a cutoff value of five above which or up to which uh, uh, you see that in this uh, Kaplan major curves the risk of having atrial fibrillation over the years is very very high. This is uh, the um, flow uh, uh, chart that uh, uh, we use in uh, my centers uh, to uh, 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 to uh, define which patients should be uh, investigated for atrial fibrillation. The uh, first, uh, you know, um, uh, threshold is age uh, below sixty and above uh, sixty. Below sixty, we look for PFO for pattern for amyloid valley or for other causes, rare grade causes uh, um, of, of stroke. Some, some some of them are you know reported here. But if we don't uh, find anything uh, of this, and if the patients uh, uh, have uh, two, at least two or more of these possible markers of risk of having atrial fibrillation, which means atrial runs, PR prolongation, LA dilatation, or LV hypertrophy, in this case, we implant loop recorders also in, in young patients. Otherwise, no. As to patients uh, uh, 60 years uh, or above, uh, we use the chance basque and or the house score uh, equal to or above four to decide whom should be implanted or uh, at e e even in presence of at least one of these variables, uh, we decide to implant the patients also uh, in case of a chance basque or an house score, which is lower than four. An intermediate uh, uh, situation is the one of patients between the age of 55 and 65. Why? Because uh, um, in uh, in uh, in the presence of um, pardon for amino uh, in these patients, uh, um, uh, the uh, consensus paper that uh, we published uh, in uh, 2020 uh, in a multi-societal uh, 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 group, uh, including you see uh, the European uh, uh, Society of Cardiology, the Heart Rhythm Association, the European Stroke Organization, and other societies. Uh, in case of patients between the age of 55 and 64 years old, we gave uh, this suggestion with this indication, which is if there are not AF risk factors and among these risk factors with considered uncontrolled hypertension, structural heart alteration, uncontrolled diabetes or congestive heart failure, in case of absence of this risk factor, it is not worthwhile to look for other fibrillation. But in case of presence of these risk factors, uh, it is worthwhile, uh, worthwhile to look for other fibrillation uh, be before considering the possibility of closing the PFO. This is, uh, uh, this and the next one are two simple e examples of what I'm saying to you. The first one is uh, um, a 63 year old female 
with any past medical history, arterial hypertension, and a non-rheumatic mitral insufficiency uh, submitted to anuloplasty at the age of 50 year uh, old. And uh, before stroke, the shaft blast score of this patient was two, and the Hubble score was four. Uh, then this patient had a stroke, uh, this is a case of uh, three years ago, you see, two, two years ago. Um, uh, she had uh, a sudden onset of left arm, uh, uh, left uh, body, let's say, uh, um, uh, hemiparesis, with also including anianopia. Uh, at entry uh, in the hospital, uh, um, the uh, patient was submitted to MR because in the past medical history, she had an, in a, a past, um, an adverse reaction to iodinate contrast agents. So we avoided to perform CT and angio CT. She has this lesion that you can see here, this temporomasial uh, right lesion, and this lesion in the uh, posterior limb of the right capsule, internal capsule. Uh, we performed uh, uh, IV thrombolysis. Uh, she had, she didn't have any large vessel occlusion, uh, and hence she was not uh, submitted to uh, thrombectomy. During hospital stay, uh, ultrasound and uh, transthoracic echocardiography um, were very conclusive. There, there was the evidence of mitral anuloplasty. The cardiological evaluation considered that at this point in time, the patient had a child's bus score of four due to stroke, in addition to hypertension and fever. Uh, sex and still and have a score of four, um, we decided to perform first a 30-day cardiac monitoring, uh, which was inconclusive, and then uh, to implant, to insert uh, a loop recorder uh, on February the 1st. And you see that on March the 8th, uh, just uh, 40 days after, um, we found AF. And then she started um, uh, rivaroxaban uh, and a, a patient evaluation uh, uh, in April 21 and January 22, the patient was well, in good conditions uh, and she was uh, and she, she, she's continuing the therapy. The second uh, uh, clinical case is that of a young male, 42-year-old male, with an arterial hypertension found only 15 days before stroke onset, so high blood pressure, occasional blood pressure, high blood pressure, and uh, uh, she, he had a, a, um, an acute onset of right amyanopia after a Valsalva maneuver, uh, followed by headache. Um, at entry, the CT, angio CT, and perfusion CT was negative, hence we performed MR diffusion, diffusion MR, and we found a very, very small, here you see, very small uh, uh, lesional area, obviously this cannot be seen by perfusion CT or by CT. Um, uh, the uh, angio MR and the perfusion MR the angiomar didn't show any kind, any large vessel occlusion. Obviously, in the perfusion MR was was negative. There was not any hypoperfused area, and hence he was not submitted to any uh, therapy of revascularization. During hospital stay, uh, the TTE uh, was substantially normal. We only saw an interarterial septum hypermobility without any detectable shunt. The trans transcranial Doppler sonograph with bubble test was positive, um, with a few emboli uh, in a basal condition and with a massive shunt shower effect of, uh, after Valsalva maneuver. The thrombophilic screening was negative, so no polymorphism of coagulation factors, no vasculitis. The cardiological evaluation was normal, no other fibrillation at 24 hour telemetry. According to the rope score of risk of, of uh, let's say, of probability that the PFO is causal and not incidental uh, is quite high, so it's seven. And the Pascal classification, which is a combination of the rope score with the anatomic characteristics of the of the um, uh, uh, PFO, to, uh, told that the that the stroke was a probably uh, related uh, to PFO. TEE, transesophageal uh, echocardiography, confirmed the hypermobility of the intraatal septum and the massive shunt after Valsalva maneuver, and hence the patient was uh, implanted with uh, an amplatzer, so it received a, an occluder of the PFO uh, with good results. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 at the outpatient clinic, uh, again, the patient is, is uh, in a very good condition. So these are very uh, two very easy, uh, 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 very simple examples uh, of the differentiation between a younger and an older patient uh, uh, with a cryptogenic stroke.
Then the second part of my presentation, I will uh, uh, stop, uh, will uh, finish very, very rapidly. Are progressive monitoring strategies cost effective? First of all, I want to show you this, uh, uh, this systematic review uh, of uh, eight papers uh, um, uh, evaluating the cost effectiveness uh, of uh, prolonged um, uh, um, ACG uh, um, uh, um, uh, evaluation registration uh, in which the prolonged uh, start from uh, a shorter period, seven to ten days uh, in these studies, uh, uh, to an intermediate period uh, up to 30 days in these studies and with a very prolonged monitoring in these studies. You see that in all these studies, but uh, with, with exception of this one and this one, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio uh, was in favor uh, of the prolonged uh, uh, the registration whatever it was uh, and in these two cases it was uh, actually cost saving uh, none of these studies uh, uh, compared one uh, uh, procedure with the other uh, so there is not a comparison between uh, the very prolonged uh, uh, registration to the shorter registration. This is one of the, of, of the limitation of this paper. The other limitation of this paper is discussed appropriately by the by by uh, the authors. Uh, in particular, uh, they wrote that uh, they used the ten percent uh, stroke rate, annual stroke rate risk uh, to. Uh, on which they based all the calculation on the risk uh, of, of having a stroke uh, in this HTA paper. So it is a simulation, a mathematical uh, a simulation. And this 10% was derived from the very old historical uh, trials comparing aspirin to warfarin in patients with AF. In those studies, uh, the AF patient uh, was uh, high was high enough to be captured by a sporadic uh, electrocardiogram. So they uh, write, uh, they wrote in this paper uh, that we don't know uh, how much uh, burden of AF should be uh, detected by a, a continuous registra registrator, you know, a prolonged registrator, uh, in order to have, you know, a burden comparable to the one of, of the the, uh, the IF diagnosed by a single 12 uh, electrocardiogram in the historical paper. So this means that probably uh, they um, overestimate a little bit the advantage uh, uh, of the uh, prolonged registration. But um, despite this, you know, um, appropriate, correct uh, uh, limitation, uh, uh, the evidence uh, is in favor of uh, a uh, longer registration of a ACG. But the paper which is, in my opinion, more interesting is this one. This is again an HTA and H health technology assessment paper and is again a simulation uh, uh, basing on the data uh, uh, again of the crystal AF uh, um, uh, trial. So uh, these orders uh, um, evaluated the um, uh, advantage, the uh, effectiveness, the efficacy in detecting other fibrillation and in uh, favoring uh, the start of uh, um, uh, anticoagulation therapy in the hands in preventing uh, the uh, occurrence of a new stroke, um, hence the efficacy uh, of uh, a prolonged uh, of different uh, um, strategies, uh, which is the st standard of care, well, the, which is intermittent ECG or altered monitoring, or immediate ICM insertion or delayed ICM insertion. And they found that immediate ICM insertion, insertion is, uh, according to this paper, both more effective and also more uh, cost-saving. Uh, in comparison uh, to the others, uh, to the other strategies, and this is uh, well evident uh, in this table, in which you see that whatever the strategy uh, was, it a delayed one-off ICM strategy, which means uh, um, the use of a halter only once before transitioning uh, to an ICM implantation after three months, or a delayed quarterly ICM strategies, which means performing an halter uh, ECG uh, every four, week, four months, so three uh, times in a year, before uh, uh, sending the patients to uh, the um, uh, ICM implantation. And even considering a possible 15% dropout rate, which means that up to 15% of patients uh, uh, receiving initially uh, an alter ECG that do not proceed to receive the ICM implantation, in all these cases, uh, 
the immediate in intracranial monitoring, implantation, insertion, dominates, which means, again, that it is more effective uh, in terms of finding AF and implementing stroke and more uh, cost effective uh, in terms of cost savings. So my conclusions are this one, that according to ESO guidelines, cryptogenic stroke patients should be submitted to search of IF without preselection. Uh, in my opinion, and I hope that I, I've been able to to, to support, in my opinion, it, with appropriate information uh, to increase the cost-benefit ratio, in particular in public health system, as the, the one in, 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 in Italy or in the United Kingdom, for instance, uh, with budget limitations, a selection based on age and on simple AF predictive scores uh, is worthwhile. The third point is that artificial intelligence uh, will likely help better selecting patients uh, to be implanted in the next year, future, in the very next future. And finally, that immediate ICM insertion seems to be more cost effective than delayed ICM insertion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Tony. It was wonderful to listen to you, but I would really like to give you my view as a cardiologist of what is the actual burden of atrial fibrillation and how we can characterize the risk. And that is going to define many of the, the search strategies of atrial fibrillation, actually. So for a cardiologist, it is very important to understand that we have this problem of cryptogenic stroke. It can have several etiologies, many of them are going to be related to the heart. And those related to the heart actually are going to have a better treatment if you choose to anticoagulate this patient instead of having antiplatelet therapy, which is much related to the large vessels atherosclerosis. So a cardiologist can actually offer some kind of help uh, with some imaging techniques and also some monitoring techniques that can uh, help to know exactly what type of cause can be underlying this stroke. So you can get cardiac CT, CMRs, uh, and it's very useful sometimes for patients that have, have a bad acoustic window to try to find out if there are any left ventricle thrombus or thrombus in the left atrial appendage. We can have advanced echo, and advanced echo means also looking at the interatrium septum to see if it is uh, actually having a patent for amenovale or an aneurysm with a leak that can cause this kind of embolism. Or, of course, looking at ACG monitoring, uh, you have several types, of course, of monitoring, but the long-term monitoring is the one that we're looking for. Uh, if you look at the Athens Stroke Registry, and here we're talking about about uh, 3,000 patients that were included, 10% of them had a stroke of an unknown source. The, the problem is, if you look at the causes of it, many of those are either from atrial fibrillation or for left ventricle dysfunction. And this is actually very, very important because you have to try to understand that the echocardiogram and the monitoring are going to be of top importance in trying to figure out which is actually reason for it. But we have several other causes, even some kind of very rare cardiomyopathies like the left ventricle non-compactation can be the cause of such a stroke. So if we have so many different phenotypes that can be underlying the stroke, we shouldn't be actually that uh, um, uh, surprised to have this bad result when we try to compare dual and uh, anticoagulation with DOAX with any platelets. And the reason that happens is actually because you're not going to have much benefit in terms of stroke and you're going to pay with the risk of hemorrhage. And that has to do with the diversity of possible causes. So the thing is, we're probably not targeting the right patients for anticoagulation. And I think that we can help when you think that probably atrial fibrillation can be the cause. We have to think about three important topics, which is the patient itself and the risk that is underlying its characteristics. You have to think about the left atrium, and there are a lot of stuff to think about. And you have to think about the electric burden, the time the patient spends in AF to know if you're looking at a patient at a very high risk of stroke or not. 
Looking at patient characteristics, it is obvious that a lot of comorbidities that you know about that are also relation, related with other types of stroke are going to be of maximum importance. So you have like hypertension, diabetes, sleep apnea, all these are going to be important. And also genetic causes and male sex can increase the probability of having uh, an atrial fibrillation. But what is most important also is to find that some of these uh, risk factors are actually modifiable. And when I'm saying modifiable, it's just not pharmacological treatment, but lifestyle straight, uh, strategies of change that are mainly important because they're not only reducing the risk of having a one uh, stroke or having one episode of atrial fibrillation, but also reducing the morbidity and mortality associated with cardiovascular diseases. So this is where the spot is. It's not just anticoagulation, it's changing everything that can actually put the patient at risk, at a higher risk of having a stroke, even if he had a previous stroke and he is already in atrial fibrillation. Of course, you have a lot of scores. I'm not going to get into this. This has been uh, largely discussed. So shad mask is just one other score that actually looks at these comorbidities. But what I would like to focus is on the left atrium. And there is actually a perfect storm that can happen in the left atrium when you have the combination of all these three things. So the electrical remodeling that occurs when a patient has atrial fibrillation that starts with excessive premature atrial contractions and some very fine and very uh, subtle uh, changes in the ACG that lead us to think that the left atrium is uh, uh, changed. And of course, then when you have some episodes of atrial fibrillation, even if they're very short, and that, that shows us that that left atrium is not actually very healthy, and there are structural changes that has not only to do with the enlargement, but with the fibrosis of the left atrium. And then again, you have a lot of inflammation going on and many of these um, uh, stretches of the left atrium are going to be related to the left ventricle being overloaded and having, of course, some kind of heart failure or um, uh, diastolic dysfunction that is underlying the cause of the changes in the left atrium. And the truth is we have two different patterns of disease. There is one disease, which is an electrical disease, which is the disease of the young people. Most of them are going to have a genetic background. Their family has uh, early on atrial fibrillation. What we have to be concerned about, it's not the risk, the thrombotic risk, because those are the ones that are going to have a child's vast of zero, but you have to be concerned on not letting uh, the age of fibrillation get into the vice, vice cycle that leads to more age fibrillation and left atrial remodeling. But the one we're talking today is actually about the systemic disease, which is atrial fibrillation. So it's not just a disease of the atrium. It's not just an electrical disease. It is a systemic disease that is conditioning this high risk of thrombotics. And Looking at it again, you have some factors that you cannot change. So if the patient already has a left atrium that is dilated, fibrotic, you cannot change that. But there are some electrical patterns that you can actually try to change and some inflammation that you can try to diminish to make sure that these patients are not going to have this, uh, again, higher risk of hypercoagulability that leads to thrombosis. And there is a continuum of the risk in these patients that has to do with the fact if they are in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, in persistent atrial fibrillation, which means they are in atrial fibrillation, but you still can get them into sinus rhythm, or if they are in permanent atrial fibrillation, so you cannot get them into sinus rhythm again. And you, when you look at this uh, kind of continuum of changes, not only in the electrical part, but also the changes that are occurring in atrial remodeling, you can see that the uh, risk of stroke is all actually increasing. And there is a, a framework where you can actually prevent this kind of happening. And there you need to have 
this prolonged monitoring after a stroke to be able to detect the subclinical atrial fibrillation. It is the moment when probably you're going to get the patient in the best phase when you can actually prevent a new event or if they didn't have an event, a first event. So the idea of the electrical burden of atrial fibrillation is a very uh, hot topic nowadays. Uh, the idea is how much time does the, the patient uh, spend in atrial fibrillation? And you can consider it in several ways, but you have to realize that many of the things that we know today have to do with the fact that we have implantable cardiac devices like pacemakers and ICDs that gave us a lot of information about what's, what was going on in patients that were completely asymptomatic. And then we had this idea that there was some kind of subclinical atrial fibrillation, which duration was variable, and we really don't get still what is the, the minimum duration to have a higher risk of stroke. But then patients get into that phase where they have actually clinical atrial fibrillation, which means that you do an ACG uh, of 12 leads and you find an atrial fibrillation, or you do a prolonged monitoring with an altar or something like that, and you get patients actually uh, in atrial fibrillation. And this is important because the fact that the patients are more time in atrial fibrillation is directly related with stroke risk. And this is something that came from some of the studies that we did with patients under antiplatelet uh, therapy. And you can see that the risk for those with permanent atrial fibrillation is clearly more than the ones in persistent or paroxysmal. Again, the time of duration of these subclinical episodes, it's really variable between, in between studies, and it is hard to realize exactly which is the right uh, time that is correlated with the risk of higher, uh, of higher risk of stroke. But it is considered that more or less five hours a day or an episode that lasts more than 24 hours are clearly associated with a higher risk. Now, we have another problem, which is not all patients that have a stroke, and we can go back in monitoring and look at the 30 days before that stroke, not all of them had an episode of atrial fibrillation in that window. So not all episodes of stroke are directly or temporarily directly related to the event of atrial fibrillation. So this means that you have no other way, of, if you suspect of it, uh, than having a prolonged monitoring to be sure that this is the cause of your uh, unknown uh, source stroke. And the question is, how much time in atrial fibrillation is too much time? So this is being discussed by electrophysiologists all over the world, and I think there is no right answer. Uh, and if, when you're talking about atrial fibrillation, you're talking about a risk marker or a cause of stroke. What I think is the, that any time in atrial fibrillation is bad for the patient because atrial fibrillation begets atrial fibrillation. So this is a vicious circle. And once you get atrial fibrillation, remodeling of the atrium is going to be establishing and you're going to get more atrial fibrillation. So this is a continuum of risk. So the good thing is not having atrial fibrillation. If you find atrial fibrillation, you have to do something about it. Now, Another, another discussion would be what time was needed for anticoagulation. But is it a marker or a cause of stroke? I would say both. And I would say that because you have to consider that the, what happen, happens in the atrium actually has to do with anatomy, function, and structure. And if you look at anatomy, you're going to look at the enlarged atriums, and you're going to look at geometry of that atrium. But if you look at structure, you're going to think about fibrosis. But then, then again, you have the function. And that's where atrial fibrillation itself is going to be the problem. Some of these patients already have all these changes that are in itself prothrombotic. But once you lose the function, once the function is actually different, once you have this very uh, nuanced changes in echocardiograms with strain of the left atrium, that shows that this left atrium is clearly not functioning well as a reservoir, then you will go to have much more risk. 
So very recently, it has been published uh, a study, which I find very interesting, because it uh, allows us to realize that we're not just talking about stroke risk when we're talking about atrial fibrillation. So considering patients that have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and have a cardiac implanted device, you can see that exposure to atrial fibrillation, so that, that concept of atrial fibrillation burden was, was seen by two different ways. It was the percentage in the atrial fibrillation each day or either the maximum duration of each episode. And you can see that either way you manage to uh, evaluate this burden, there is a clear relationship between the atrial fibrillation burden and the all-cause mortality. And this is also true for cardiovascular hospitalization. And interestingly, interestingly, it's not that related with ischemic stroke. So when we're talking about atrial fibrillation, we're not just talking about the risk of having a stroke. So atrial fibrillation has also to do with a higher rate of mortality, a higher rate of heart failure. Patients often get dementia, but also have poor quality of life, depression, and more cardiovascular hospitalizations. And again, if you look at patients that are anticoagulated, and this is, of course, an analysis including the four big trials with DOACs for uh, prevention of stroke and embolism in atrial fibrillation, when you look at the causes of deaths, most of these deaths are going to be cardiac deaths. So atrial fibrillation in well-treated patients is only to contribute the stroke itself, well, it's going to contribute to very little part of this mortality. Most of this mortality is going to be cardiac mortality. So when thinking of patients with atrial fibrillation, even if they already had a stroke and you find this atrial fibrillation and then you say, wow, I have here the answer, I just have to anticoagulate the patient and that's it, you're wrong because there is much more to do. And you have to stratify these patients, looking at their comorbidities, treating aggressively these comorbidities, looking at the atrium and trying to understand if there's anything you can do to reverse this phenotype that can actually lead to more uh, embolic risk and further episodes. And again, look at the time patients have in atrial fibrillation, because sometimes we are still in due time to do an ablation and diminish this risk. So when you think about, about atrial fibrillation, don't think only of the brain, think also about the heart. Thank you for your attention. The first two questions are addressed to Professor Tony. Good afternoon, Danilo. Good afternoon, Georgios. Uh, the first question is, uh, how long will you consider keeping the ILR in situ in a 70, a 57 year old patient with a multi-territory infarcts with no other cause identified? So I showed in my presentation that in patients younger than 60 years, in, if, if we find other causes, obviously, uh, PFO, vasculitis or other uh, causes like this, we have to treat them. In my center, I decide to uh, implant a patient younger than 60 years old with an ILR only in case of presence of those alterations that I remember you, uh, the hypertrophy, uh, a dilatation, uh, premature beats, etc., etc. In case th there are no such, uh, let's say, possible uh, uh, indicators of the risk of having a YF, we do not implant patients. If we decide to implant a patient younger than 57, then we decide to prolong the uh, registration uh, as, as long as possible, as long as, as possible, just like in a patient older than, than, uh, than 60. Yes, a clear answer. The second question to Danilo is, is patient refusal due, due to invasiveness an issue? It may happen. Sometimes it happens because sometimes the patients are uh, uh, scared by the information of having something implanted below, uh, you know, the skin. Uh, but if you explain them uh, in a plain way that there is no problem, there is no risk, for instance, with metal detectors uh, uh, in, uh, in the uh, airport or something like this, uh, at the very uh, end, they they accept to do it. Otherwise, obviously, you have to take into account their opinion. 
Okay. Thank you again for a very clear answer. Then I'm moving now to questions to Professor Gavina. Uh, Gavina, thank you also for a very uh, comprehensive lecture. The first question is, are other biomarkers considered important discrimination discriminators when selecting stroke patients for prolonged monitoring? Well, there is a lot of discussion about biomarkers right now, and you do have a few that have been popping up in the literature. I am very skeptical about biomarkers because I really believe that uh, you have to be really, really lucky to get a biomarker that gives you a clear answer. So biomarkers are usually continuous variables, and it's very hard to find a cutoff that can actually help you to decide which patients are you going to do something in and the, the other ones you're not. And this is a problem because it is, it is completely different thresholds between populations if you're going to try to validate this kind of cutoff. So I wouldn't go there. I think we have enough tools right now to be sure that we are selecting the right patients for prolonged monitoring. And it is the prolonged monitoring that is going to decide after all, if you're going to find the atrial fibrillation. So I'm not that keen on biomarkers. I don't think those are going to be the answers. Although I understand all this enthusiasm, trying to find something that is easier to uh, measure so that you can actually get the answer. Yeah, I think uh, mid-regional pro-ANP, which is now being investigated in the phase three trial, Moses trial, which is an investigator-driven trial from Switzerland, uh, might be a promising biomarker, but we need more phase three randomized data because this moves into clinical practice. Totally agree with Christina. The second question addressed to Professor Gavina is, what is the role of wearable technology in the monitoring strategies? In simple words, do you trust wearable technology? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, we are actually taking decisions on wearable technology also. So I think this is important. Um, they're not as good as implantable recorders, but they can work pretty well for uh, some patients that have actually a very, very high threshold of risk so that you can have it. Um, for the eye layers, it is clear that they work beautifully uh, in being able to detect with very little uh, um, uh, loss of uh, specificity. Uh, they are really able to detect atrial fibrillation. So we are anticoagulating patients based on the results of these records. And we are having very, very good results. The problems we had at first were actually with the other devices when we had ICDs and had uh, pacemakers that actually the leads were not prepared to make this kind of diagnosis. But the, the ILRs nowadays are very precise and you can do a very, very good diagnosis. Okay. Now there is a question addressed to me. Often the cardiologists are concerned that the RCTs for dogs are not based on ILR detected AF. Thus, is effect safety comparable to the dog trials if AF is identified using ILR and or the cardiologists supporting this approach by strokeologists? I think that uh, we have a a solid answer with regard to ILR detected AF in the recent meta-analysis showing that both in secondary and primary prevention, if you pull the results of randomized trials, there is evidence that uh, anticoagulation based on ILR detected AF reduces the risk of first ever stroke by approximately 9% and uh, recurrent stroke by approximately 30% using meta-analytical approach. So I think this is solid data. And with regard to the approach of cardiologists uh, compared to uh, stroke physicians, I don't like the term strokeologist. I don't know what <laughs> Daniel thinks. I think he I think Agreed. Milo agrees because he <laughs> smiles. It's like stroke physicians, uh, vascular neurologists, you can name it. Uh, so 
there is an interesting survey that was conducted in UK and uh, uh, approximately 92 to 95% of stroke experts would be willing to anticoagulate a patient with cryptogenic stroke based on ILR information. Uh, and the respective uh, uh, numbers for cardiologists were approximately 85%. So I think uh, both societies agree and there are multiple white papers, consensus papers, uh, like the recent one published uh, in um, e-cardiology that uh, advocate to uh, treat the patients based on ILR data. So I think that uh, we are very clear on that. And we have a cardiologist on our panel. So, Christina, do you agree with this approach? Um, definitely. The only problem for me is that we shouldn't just stick to anticoagulation. And that was actually the point I was trying to make in my presentation is that this is not only about anticoagulating patients. So I, I am absolutely sure that we should anticoagulate patients if you find uh, AF in patients that already had a stroke. The question here uh, under debate several times is for patients that are uh, having little bouts of atrial fibrillation and never had a stroke. And that's where the question is raised about how much time do you have to be on atrial fibrillation to be anticoagulated. And that is a totally different. If you had an ischemic stroke that you think it is of an unknown source and you get some kind of detection of atrial fibrillation in an ILR, you should anticoagulate that patient. But you shouldn't forget about everything that is going on that is going to also to increase the risk of a repeated event, even in patients anticoagulated. So it is very important to realize that these patients, it's not just the rhythm that is augmenting their thrombotic risk. There is a lot going on systemically that has to be handled to be able to diminish this risk. Yes. I think this is a very clear message and we should employ all secondary prevention exactly. strategies uh, very robustly in these patients. Uh, the last co question, coming from the audience uh, is also directed towards myself. Is the current risk stratification evidence and what's to come enough for moving ILR into a higher recommendation from guidelines? Outcome seems to be a challenge. So I want to be very clear on that. Uh, you know, especially ISO guidelines are based on grade approach and we evaluate the data coming from randomized trials and from observational studies. So this will not change based on risk certification, but I think that uh, now we have additional studies and uh, we should pull all secondary prevention trials independent of the risk of underlying uh, stroke based on stroke subtype. What I mean is that we should not be interested if this is cryptogenic stroke or if this is large artery atherosclerotic stroke or if this is lacunar stroke. I wish to remind to our audience that all the secondary prevention trials with regard to vitamin K antagonists that showed superiority compared to aspirin included patients with ischemic stroke TIA and AF. They included lacunar stroke, they included large artery atherosclerosis, and they, they included cryptogenic stroke. So I think that we need to move further with the guidelines, and these guidelines should include all ischemic stroke patients with evidence of AF. Now, if we pull together the available trials, then we would have enough evidence to increase the risk of certainty and of robustness of the guidelines based on randomized data. And I think this is the way to move forward. And uh, I'm looking also uh, very forward to the results of the uh, Italian trial that is being directed by Professor Tony. And I think this trial is focusing on this specific question. So Danilo, if you want to say a few words and then I will close the session yes, for your trial. True. It's true because in, in the SAFO trial, we looked for atrial fibrillation in patients with an in the stroke, which was atrial thrombotic or lacunar. Uh, something like the uh, stroke AF trial, you know, the stroke AF trial is approximately the same as ours. And in the stroke AF trial, they found AF in this kind of patient in up to approximately 25% of patients, if I'm correct. So it, it is important also in a definite, let's say, uh, stroke like an atron thrombotic or a lacunar 
taking into account the possible risk of having AF, which doesn't mean obviously that you have to implant all these patients again to look for AF, but you have to uh, focus your attention on the possibility that uh, there is a, 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 a total amount of risk of stroke and that the new stroke, the recurrent stroke, uh, may be different from the index one. Thank you, Danilo. I think uh, we're five minutes late. I wish to thank our audience. I was informed that we had uh, 235 uh, colleagues who were uh, connected online. I wish to remind everybody that uh, this educational webinar that is endorsed by ESO and sponsored by Medronic will be also available in ESO ISTE platform. So whoever wants, uh, they can uh, also visit the platform and see the webinar again, or people who could not make it today, they can see it uh, at a later stage. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Danilo. Thank you, Christina, for these excellent lectures. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.